Indo Pacific Exploring Opportunities for India, organized by the Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, and the Jadavpur Association of International Relations, in partnership with the Indian Council of Foreign Affairs. I am the MC for the event, Alokanandana, from the International Relations Department, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Before we start the formal proceedings, I request you to put your mobile phones on silent mode and avoid conversation during the proceedings. Thank you very much for your cooperation. We now have some chanting followed by a welcome song presented before us by the students of International Relations, Jalapur University. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now for the inaugural session, I may now request Professor Urbi Das, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, to kindly felicitate Maharaj. Thank you. I would now request Professor Partho Prothim Basu, Professor Department of International Relations, to 
to come to the dais and set the context of the day by introducing before us the theme of the conference. And I request Professor Shreya Montro to kindly come and felicitate sir. Thank you. May I now request the speakers for the inaugural session to come to the dais for the introductory remark. Dr. Pragya Pandey, fellow Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, and Sri Onirban Sharma, senior fellow observer, researcher, foundation, Kolkata. So, I request Professor Chirunji Bhattacharya, Pro Vice Chancellor, Jadavpur University, to come to the dais for the special address of the session. I request the students of international relations to kindly felicitate our dignitaries. <laughs> May I now request Professor Shucharitra Chattopadhyay, Dean of Faculty of Arts, Jadavpur University, to please come to the dais for the special address of the session and our students to felicitate ma'am for the same. Thank you. We may please have a round of applause. I request Srimad Swami Shukranda Nando, Secretary, Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Gold Park, to kindly set the context of Vasudeva Kutumbakam for the inaugural session. I'm really sorry for the disturbance. Uh, I would request Professor Rimon Kolan Lairi to kindly come to the dais and deliver his welcome remarks for the session. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and very, very important to be very well as and proper all over the country. Uh, I'm really thankful to. Indian Council of World Affairs, Ministry of Heavy Industries, also World Research Foundation, to put us to organize this conference for the next two days. We have with us for the century of the charity, which always with us and supporting us for very long time for different events. We have Shuchurita, me, Shuchurita Chattopadha with the team. In the Faculty of the Arts of this university. We have Prakta Pandey from the Council of World Affairs. We have Onirvan Dao from Observer Research Foundation, Professor Pathakutin Basu, and most importantly, 
Swami Shukranandaji Ji Maharaj, our beloved Shukranandaji. Now, what is important for us uh, to discuss for the next two days that we are doing for the last three months, rather, since January, and this is the ninth event we are hosting on G20. And to know the basic underlying perspective what G20 is giving us, the basic concept of Vasudeva Kutumbhaka. And I'm sure that Maharaj will discuss on that particular aspect of understanding the phrase. But in the Pacific, as far as the region is concerned, that it is a transformation from the concept of Asia Pacific for a very long time. But there are many scholars like Jairam Ramesh and others who perceive the region in a different way. Sometimes they raise the issues like Chin India. But now what is beneficial for us, the concept of Indo is preceding the idea of Pacific. So we can take the lead in the region in different aspects, not only from the perspective of militarization or as we are discussing in the last couple of seminars that the different aspect of security, terrorism, counter-terrorism, but also from the perspective what India can give to the world. And it is now really a time that we are dealing with the soft power diplomacy for a very long time. But as we are discussing with Professor Mahapatra yesterday, that it is our time to focus the secular aspect of India in the other neighborhood or maybe the extended neighborhood of India, and where we can discuss more about Vivekananda, more about Sri Ramakrishna, who gave us the basic understanding of secular identities and based on what, what we feel and what we see or what we perceive in India today. Not only Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, but also along with them, maybe Gandhi, maybe Tagore, we can incorporate them, maybe Tilak, we can incorporate them, maybe see Chaitanya. So these are the ideas what world needs to understand now. For a very long time, we have perceived the Western version of the understanding of international relations. But it is now the time so that we can discuss more and more of these aspects where we get equality, justice, everything. Because you know that I will just end up with a quote by uh, Swamiji, Swami uh, Vivekananda. That what liberty is, liberty is not the absence of restraint in the path of misappropriation of wealth, etc. by you and me, but it is our natural right to use our own body, mind, and intelligence according to our own will. And Swamiji said it long back, 150 years back, he was saying all these aspects. And his idea of modernity may be conceptualized now in the present day concept. When we are just Uniting different countries like UK, United States, Australia, Japan, and maybe India. And Swamiji's concept of this idea that is intermingling of East and the West long back. And I'm sure that uh, this seminar will definitely give us more and more aspect to understand what India is today. I'm thankful to my colleagues, my teachers by students uh, that they have, they are constant, uh, continuously participating in this aspect and of course, uh, thankful to our professor, Salasar, Dean Madam and the dignitaries who have taken the trouble to come all the way to, to attend this conference. Thank you so much, sir. May I now request Swami Shukranda Nando, Secretary Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, Golpa, to kindly come to the dais and set the context for the inaugural session. Thank you. So I'm thankful to the organizers, especially uh, Professor Kimon Chandran uh, for the kind invitation that I also have accorded to me to speak about a very important topic. Uh, 
বছর ধরে প্রচুর বড় ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল লুকিং এট দি ওয়ার্ল্ড ফার্স্ট দা রিলেশন বসু ধা ইন দি ইউনিভার্স এন্ড উই আর দি অবজারভার্স আই এন ইন্ডিভিজুয়াল হাউ ডু আই লুক এট দ্য ইউনিভার্স এরাউন্ড ওয়াট রিলেশন উই ক্যান থিঙ্ক বিটুইন দি টু বিটুইন মাইক্রোকজম এন্ড ম্যাক্রোকজম বাট দে ডিফারেন্ট সো ইউ মে সে দ্যাট ইউনিভার্স in its macro aspect is dead dull matter kitty of this molot bomb these are the five elements i should say first element and there is nothing there in common to us we individuals share our consciousness but we have in us the inner part inner part is the body but within each of us are at this mind and intellect and of course prana but these are categorized as even matter the final part of matter because of that association with consciousness itself they look like they look like consciousness that is the discovery of the indian sages long ago i will i will i will try to give you an account very just very very briefly the way they used to connect this inner insensitive part of matter cosm into fitting quite fitting into the living part of our being so that there is no basic difference between the universe and the individual so city of the morud bomb that these are all the five material aspects of the universe my dear it includes everything it is the earth of water water bodies of the earth chemicals of the area of the universe you know then then why then stage of agni and then star so universe means this and are we different from and individuals are we different from this what this earth this water this fire this vayu or air and the ether no if you want to know this those down if you want to know this that chair in its ultimate state you cannot see it in the physical we can divide an object because it occupies some space and you go on dividing the whole universe in order to know the basis of it 
exist on what infrastructure this entire edifice I call universe is standing. The ultimately will come to atom. An atom has been broken into 200 times success in order to get to the ultimate uh, reality on which this universe is stand. Basically. And this has been done by the scientists. There is no scope of speculation here. Scientists, they have proved that there is unity in matter. That is, if you want to know the chair, I think Chirunjit is a man from science. So physics says, or even chemistry says that we'll get to atom first. And they used to feel that atom is the last state of existence of the universe. But again, 200 times they have broken this atom. In the middle, they have come and close. Electron and proton. But ultimately, they didn't suggest they started their journey and ultimately found out that it is what? The hypothetical party which had existence but no dimension would not be visible by any sophisticated microscope. It is there, but it has a greater tendency to go beyond this space. So when a particle goes beyond the space, it becomes invisible. We have defined points that point having existence but no dimension. And that is the seat of all power. So scientists have been doing this because they wanted to know the seat of power. Power is in the small, not in the so big. And you know the effect of this power, hydrogen bomb. Not only atom of hydrogen, nuclear. This is the state of this physical universe. And they say that we do not know where they have gone. This whole entire universe, where it has gone, we do not have any way to know that. Because it goes out of our taste. It is not to be experimented in the laboratory itself. But they say we do not know. Being very small, it is very small. So, when they jump, when they jump, how does it Yes, we need to everything in the universe. That is the reality. The antivirus has become this. Divided by coming to space. This is, this is the reality about the physical universe. And Samiji says, and you say that it is not there in the physical universe, it has come into you, in your prana. So, ultimate resting point of the whole universe is the prana. <laughs> And then, spirit or consciousness. So this guy, who is even living being? The soul it is also conscious. And it was proved by the religious. I don't go into the details of that. But that's why it is the limit of the human part of the revelation. And he wanted to prove, and he could prove beyond doubt that the universe, what we 
another way to measure is also so we have established the relation between ourselves and bigger humans. But what about uh, we? We are all different persons sitting over here with different bodies. And what is there? And we feel it in the waking state. We have found so many differences. Difference between man and Inter -data, inter -data difference between the region of the pool, difference between the virtuous and the vicious. In so many different ways, we have, we have been sustained these differences somewhat. But we do not want to explore where we are one. Yes, we are one. When you go to sleep and dream, your body are lying on the bed sleep, but you come out of the body and create a new world in the body. What is there? The clothes go lying on the bed sleep. And you, as mind, you have separated your self. Your body from mind. Yes. You come out of the body, mind, and create a new world in mind, which you enjoy or suffer. You, 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 yes. you have a, a creative heart, and you fulfill that. There we, we exist in mind. There we exist in mind. And you remember, take a song, the famous song. Mon che, or mon che, or mon mon Who can say it? Tere mal. Amar mon che, or mon mon Tere mal. Nobody. From the leader's side, going to take over and correct it. So how could the mind see? Mon zero. Mind cannot see. But yes, from this little discussion that just I have that in dream we see the Minds are because our physical mind has closed remaining in the base. And what light? With what light we see all this? Because there is a filter. There is reflective light, sun's light, light, moon's light, candles light, all lights are at the same. But still, we can visualize everything that we see. So as a mind, sometimes I see, how do you see? That we are lying there. If it's something you have to be of your own physical body. You can see so many things, but it is in your power to see the your, see your own body. So that means that you have a body here. You have no you have a body. I am six. I can take it out. You know, I can come out of my body and the mind and dream. The dream state is as here, as a world here, than what you see in the waking state. I'm afraid that you, none of you, have got that sort of thing in the taste. And as my we are closer to our dream. That's why I can accommodate to be the same this point. In so many months. And last of all, we go to sleep and enjoy our sleep. We lost it. 
sleep itself being completely forgetful. So when you sleep, when you are in deep sleep, there is no consciousness of our existence, body and mind and intellect, everything, for which we take so much of interest and pride of We are all different because of differences in mind and body and intellect. These are all facts. That's why you do not feel it when you are in deep sleep. So, what does it mean? We are one with our existence, with our reality. We are one with consciousness. Um, that is, that alone is real. And there is no distinction between a man and a man. Man and woman. That in this deep should say we are always one with our real nature for four to five hours a day. If you cannot sleep, you would become insane. So we do not. Want to know our real existence, real nature, when you are in the waking state. I think it's a point. So when you go to sleep and enjoy your sleep, you, you must know that it is not disturbed by my mind. They cannot create a disturbance. They are Mind, body, intellect, they are lost in consciousness. So this is our real nature. And in consciousness, we are all one. And because we are all people who can go to sleep and enjoy the mind that this is our real nature. And we are all potentially divine. Samiti has. Again, over again and over again, just this point that each soul is potentially divine. Because in deep sleep, we are one with this pure. We have to go the waking state. We don't if we can know in deep sleep. But spiritual life, the religious life, means that you have to know the state of your existence, real existence. Through what? Through unselfish service. To service, God is a spirit of sacrifice. That's the way of answer. You have to convert your occupation into a meeting ground of. When you are just speaking to your students, you have to look upon your students as the manifestation of their nature. Not that you are speaking to the handicap. So convert your occupation with the giving of life into such a way that. You develop as you detach mind. That's the most important of all of us. And somebody has expressed them so beautifully. Famous, famous poet, Shaka Poet. Give it the quality of safety. Those who serve Jivo, looking upon the Jivo as an ancestor, he actually serves God. So the reality is this divinity. And what we get, the scientists have proved that the world is. Not made of matter only, ultimately, 
in his kingdom. He goes out of the material world, space. But we say, just come and you enter us, our God. And as human beings, we are not just body mind complex, we also go beyond body and beyond mind, beyond intelligence. And we are one undivided form. That means the reality that we are all mothers and sisters, we are all one. There is no difference between man and man. Because we just scientifically prove we have to work on it. We have to work. Nobody is on it. We have to make other food our by serving. By serving, service. Well, sometimes we say the individual part. I test the individual part only because obvious reason that if individuals are correct in the society, the nation, and this international development. The international understanding of human unity. There is human unity. We have to first understand. Human unity and material unity. Both. We have to understand. And gradually, we have to extend our Experience. We have to state of God. A concern and love. Those who are our enemies, enemies, nobody is our enemy. Nobody is our enemy. That is very, very important. That's why I say that individuals we produce from our schools and colleges and universities, they are self centered, aggressive. Ambitious, greedy, and competitive. Can we have an environment that is non violent, peaceful, cooperative, and harmonious? Yeah. So we have to get that unit. As individuals, if we are endowed with this concept of consciousness, legally, inside and outside, we are one individual. We cannot establish a peaceful atmosphere within ourselves and within society. So, this was the universe we are very old, only in this sense, not in the universe. There are so many ways to prepare ourselves for that. There is Jogo, there is Gyanu, Gyanu Jogo, Radha Jogo, there is Bhakti Jogo, and there is Karma Jogo. So Swami just says Karma Jogo very much, because we have to do our own, and if we can, Divinize our spiritualize our day to day work. Day to day work. If we can feel others are suffering their suffering as our own, and try to remove their suffering and enjoy their happiness, we will be amply reward for the world. So, I have given you an idea. What is the meaning of the Bhushma Evo Kutubhava? And you have to work on it simply by being, by being unselfish. Sometimes you, even if you can say that you are not behaving uh, in a better way. But if you, if the, if the student in turn asks you, ask you, sir, 
You have been telling me repeatedly to behave in a better but I can't. And I feel I cannot do so if I am not. So what is your the conception of a better man? Who is a better man? A better man is unselfish. An unselfish man not me, but you. Your sufferings, your joy, are my sufferings. In the Bhagavad Gita, 6th chapter, 32nd shloka, 32nd shloka, in Buddha. The beautiful Gita will explain. Atma to me, Sarva, Prabhupada, Amanta, Sukhi, Yoga, Shloka, Yoga, 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 if I can accept others' joys and suffer, sufferings, then I will be God. The rest of your needs, so you be for no more. So you did not have to go for the money. You did not have to give up the work yourself to become that. You did not have to seek for meditation. For us to be there. But yes, these are all necessary, but because that you have to purify your heart. You have to purify your heart. So we are supposed to serve this the students. Because I am a teacher, I am I am worshiping them. They are my thoughts and words. They are to be worshipped and respected, honored. But can we exploit them? So this is for one purpose. The business starts. Then what you need to have maximum of profit. And they exploit the customers. But just see if Parma Yoko is practiced. And if we can understand the real nature of Parma and its effect on us, then we would not blame any other people for the joys and sufferings that we are living. Joys and sufferings that come as a result of Parma we are not. We have to be very much further. On the right, on the, on the type of hormones we understand. If we can purify our karma, we can purify our karma. And with pure mind, we have the reason for the pure karma. That is the reason. And that's why these people, Buddha, the Christ, Sri Ramakrishna, the they are, they are the gems of. Human beings. I won't say human beings, just living. People are on the divine gods. They are the real source of power. Because they make the universe in that very form. And how far you have been able to do that, then it takes. After doing this selfless service, you go back to the evening, you leave the shrine and sit over there for meditation. And if you can have proper meditation in the very short period of time, mind that what you have been doing outside has been down to the near. Yes. It is what, what, and what that you have to make. So don't blame any other persons around you for your misfortune, for your suffering. Everything is there for you. So with this mind, if you come, you face the entire world, the world becomes very, very poor. You are connecting the Indo Pacific with the ingredients of it. 
and you have to make sense with them. You have to make all these people, the gentlemen, the people who are holding their country, you know, very, very, very old. But you have to approach them with such mind of accepting the entire Accepting. If you have to be pettiness, greed, animosity, violence, you cannot retain for You cannot make it. Very good question. Can we make it subject for producing relations with the other countries? So it depends on how you manage your own planet. You like People moving around here. If you do not come to help the people around you, either. you are not sufficient. In, in, in making other people of other things. There should not be any effect in the chamber of Avail for it and two be You have to make your mind Thank you so much, Swami Supra Mondo. Now I request Professor Chiromuji Pottacharji, the Pro Vice Chancellor Jagatpur University, to come to the dial for the special address of the session. Such as India Market, Indian Board, 
Allah'ın görünmez. Hayır. O. Aynen o. Allah'ın görünmez. Kimlerdi? Yıl, yıl kurarlı sonra. Tümü, sonra. Bu çok tümü bağlı. Demek ki bu bir tümü bağlı. Yani ilim çok doğrusu ki, you cannot have it. Burası. You are always single. Tak tamuş. Tak tamuş. Thank you, sir. May I now request Professor Shucharitra Tortopadhyay, Dean Faculty of Arts, Jadavpur University, to come to the dais for the special address of the session. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today as a special guest of honor. On behalf of Jadup University and also on behalf of the Faculty of Arts, I welcome all the delegates and also congratulate the Department of International Relations for uh, organizing a conference of such relevance. I am not an expert in the subject and I will not uh, try to come up with comments on the topic because I'm far removed from it. But uh, I would like to say in this context that in today's reality, the world is shrinking very fast. Connectivity has made us come closer and it is eminently possible to reach out to others and share thoughts. Earlier, when we were growing up, even in our student days, that was not even a distinct possibility. Physical traveling was needed. So it is easier for us to communicate with people and it is imperative that we try to cash on to the facilities that this world offers us. And therefore, uh, I think it would be of tremendous interest uh, to see what critical purviews come up during this uh, two-day conference and uh, researchers across geographical boundaries, across cultures will be putting their minds together, putting their thoughts together. And I'm sure the conference will end with a, a storehouse of possibilities of future research, future collaborations, and def definite ways out of the problems that we are able to identify. So on that note, I will not be taking much time. I wish everybody the best. And I hope uh, International Relations Department comes up with a fantastic conference over the next two days. Uh, and I also would like to excuse myself because I have to run to attend another meeting. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. I would now request Professor Partho Pruting Dasu, Professor, Department of International Relations, to come to the dais and set the context of the day by introducing before us the theme of the conference. Thank you. And uh, the theme is very much there before us that is connecting into a Pacific and the opportunities opens up for India. Uh, I, may, I may just uh, discuss a few points, very few, very key points. Just to begin with the idea of Indo-Pacific, that is, it's a geostrategic and 
and this has become this is gaining popularity over the last decade or so. And uh, basically, a number of countries, for example, Japan, United States, Australia, India, France, some of the South Asian states, ASEAN states. Now, in their security responses, this 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 is becoming this uh, geostrategic construct is becoming very prominently. And uh, as already been indicated, this is perhaps uh, promising to replace the previously dominant uh, construct of Asia. Now, we have uh, talked about, uh, just mentioned several countries, several powers, uh, which uh, highlight through their security discourses the idea of Indo Pacific. And uh, of course, different understandings emerge from this book, uh, they have different texts on it. But at the same time, there is a common denominator, and this is the key thing I, uh, in, uh, to my mind. That is the two oceans of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. They are imagined as one contiguous area. That's the core, I think. And this idea, this notion is based on the fact that uh, well, a huge volumes of uh, world's of goods and energy supplies are transported via the sea routes that uh, lie through this moon. Now, um, to briefly look at the origin of the concept, that is, uh, the concept was floated by the Japanese Prime Minister Yoshinobu in 2007, and interestingly, when he was addressing the Indian Parliament, uh, on he was actually delivering a lecture on the confluence of the two seas, so that says it all. And he was advocating basically uh, a case for strengthening uh, political and economic changes among the various democracies situated in the Indian and Pacific. And for securing this was important from his perspective, it was important for securing the sea lanes and uh, promoting economic prosperity. But uh, we also have to acknowledge that uh, the concept uh, gained traction when uh, it was the United States, a number of presidents from the United States, from Obama, Trump, and even Biden, when they lent their weight behind this concept around. Uh, 2016, 17, 19, and uh, following this, several countries actually adopted this Indo Pacific construct. We have already mentioned the major countries that uh, this connection, uh, but we also need to emphasize that uh, following this uh, adoption of this concept uh, by the United States, uh, the India, the Indo Pacific emerged as an arena in which uh, the growing rivalry between the United States and China playing out. Uh, now, finally, turn to India's, uh, in the case of India, because we are also talking about, uh, the, we are also highlighting, as Professor Lahiri emphasized, we are also highlighting the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific, and uh, uh, we are talking about the opportunities of India. Now, Indian foreign policy remained for a long time, but till the end of the 20th century, on the continental borders. Obviously, the major challenges the major threats we are managing from the northern and northeastern borders. Uh, of course, it did not, did not neglect the maritime aspect, maritime aspect of power. At the same time, we can say that it is in the 21st century, it is in the 21st century that uh, the maritime men uh, seem to require greater focus, greater um, salience in Indian foreign policy. And uh, of course, uh, the transition from India's focused policy to that is certainly had some impasses in Indian policy as well. And uh, it was uh, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi's address in the Shangrana dialogue held in 2018 in Singapore. Uh, in this dialogue, he outlined the vision and policy elements of uh, regarding uh, Indo Pacific. And um, of course, there was at the back of his speech at the back of this idea is that there's the idea of preventing China from dominating this particular region. But at the same time, there was a call for a very general kind of call for uh, an open and inclusive order, promoting an open and inclusive order in the Indo-Pacific based on respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all these countries. Now, finally, to cut to the present, uh, as far as the present uh, focus the present concern is in the Indo Pacific is concerned. Uh, we can identify two aspects. So on the one hand, there is an it is it is evolving as 
an idea of potential political and military contestation in that confrontation. But on the other hand, we find that it's opened up uh, multifold avenues of global and regional economic work. So it's also true that the contours of the Indo-Pacific strategies, so the different countries we have mentioned, or for that matter, the regional groups, they diverse, they vary very widely. Uh, for example, at one end, we have uh, the confrontation attitude adopted by the United States. But on the other hand, we have the ASEAN or the European Union who adopt a more inclusive uh, kind of attitude, more benign and inclusive kind of attitude. Uh, yet, we find that there are many points of convergence. And these multi uh, multiple points of convergence open up different kinds of opportunities for India as well. I'll just conclude by mentioning a few. First of all, there is the question of maritime security, enhanced military cooperation to secure water and sea lanes. But on the other hand, there is also possibilities for maritime cooperation to ensure sustainable use of maritime resources, promoting blue economy, uh, mitigating uh, maritime pollution or various climate-induced uh, uh, sea level rise and other kinds of issues. Thirdly, we can talk about improving connectivity, connectivity both in the transport dimension, human connectivity, and when you talk about digital agenda, you can also talk about seeking cooperation on uh, futuristic things like uh, the transition to 5G to 6G. But we can keep in mind that China is dom has been dominating the 5G technology, so obviously, uh, so that that sets a, a backdrop for uh, working on 6G technology with others. And last but not the least, there is the clamor for uh, supply chain uh, diversification, and this is also emerging very prominently in the schools today. And uh, this definitely gives India a potential kind of uh, an opportunity to leverage its potential for emerging as a preferred destination for continent. So I hope that these issues will be taken up in the subsequent sessions, and I congratulate the organizers for. Uh, organizing this very important conference from uh, Asia Pacific to the Pacific, and uh, I uh, then wish this uh, to you. Thank you, Professor Basu. May I now request? Uh, Dr. Pragya Pandey, Fellow, Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, to kindly come to, to the dais for her introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, it is my pleasure and an honor to speak here today. The mic is okay. To speak here today, this uh, very important gathering. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Jadavpur University, Department of International Relations, for having me today. Uh, special thanks and many congratulations to Professor Lahiri and his team for organizing this conference on very pertinent theme, the connecting the Indo-Pacific, exploring the opportunities for India. Uh, let me first begin with a few words about my institution, which I'm representing today, the Indian Council of World Affairs, especially for those in the audience who have not interacted with us uh, before. Uh, the ICWA established in 1943 uh, by a group of public intellectuals with the principal objective to create an Indian perspective on international relations and act as repository of knowledge and thinking on foreign policy issues. By an act of parliament in 2001, ICWA is an institution of national importance. The council today conducts uh, policy research through an in-house faculty as well as through ex external experts. And we also organize uh, an array of intellectual activities like conferences, seminars, outreach programs to uh, you know, universities and institutions across the country, and also bring out a range of publications. We have our own journal, India Quarterly, which publishes uh, regularly. And the council has MOU with around 50 uh, uh, MOUs with international think tanks and research institutions. And we also partner with the leading research institutions and think tanks universities in India. One of the important initiatives of the council is the outreach. 
uh, to the institutions and universities across the country. It is under this scheme that today we are collaborating with the Jadapur University for this conference. And I'm very glad that this collaboration will be very uh, fruitful and very sure that it will be very, uh, you know, uh, enlightening discussion will be taking place over the next two, uh, over the two days. Since we are going to discuss uh, matters maritime in this conference, I must mention that ICWA have made a conscious effort to uh, focus on issues related to maritime security. And a focus has gr been a great deal on the strategic affairs of the Indian Ocean and the wider Indo-Pacific region in our research, in our outreach activities. Uh, today, we are discussing one of the most crucial topics of the contemporary times. And I'm looking forward to hear the views of all the eminent experts who have gathered here. The Indo-Pacific region that we are talking about today uh, basically essentially characterizes the large, uh, uh, vast maritime geography, which combines the two you know, large bodies of water, Indian and the Pacific Ocean. The region has been uh, gaining immense uh, strategic, economic, political, and diplomatic uh, uh, significance across the wide spectrum. And there is a certainly significant economic and strategic value attached to the Indo-Pacific region. For uh, India's vision uh, for the region stands for a free, open, inclusive, and rules-based uh, uh, region, as enunciated by our Prime Minister uh, Sri Narendra Modi at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018. Uh, today, we are meeting at a time of heightened strategic uncertainty, not just in the region but across the world. So, I will elaborate with these issues further in my presentation in the technical round. For now, without taking much time, I will stop here and look forward to the fruitful discussion. And I'm confident that deliberations of the conference will be very stimulating and productive. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Sri Onirban Sharma, Senior Fellow, Observer Research Foundation, Kolkata, to kindly come to the tires and deliver his introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor Iman Kollan Lahiri, Professor Patsu Pratim Basu, Dr. Pragya Pandey, and colleagues and friends, a very good morning to you, and it's a pleasure to be here today at this conference on the Indo-Pacific. On behalf of the Observer Research Foundation, where I work, um, at the outset, I'd like to thank the Jadapur University Department of International Relations, with which ORF, in fact, has a long and close relationship, the Jadapur Association of IR, and, of course, the ICWA for bringing us all together and hosting us over the next couple of days. Um, you know, on a more personal note, I happen to be an alumnus of JU myself, and I spent five of my best years here. So coming back to the university is, is really a sort of homecoming for me, and a return to the alma mater in every sense of the word. Um, now, when we speak of connecting the Indo-Pacific, we usually tend to think of the more conventional domains of maritime relations, trade, security, economic cooperation, and transport. So I was really quite delighted when uh, Professor Bhattacharjee and Professor Basu before me actually touched upon the digital aspect of connectivity as well. Uh, this is really what I'd like to build on and speak a little about myself, these issues of digital connectivity and cyber cooperation, and to try and explore how they're contributing to the notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, in terms of the growth and use of technology, this is a particularly exciting moment for the region. And the moment, in fact, has given rise to the phrase, the digital Indo-Pacific. Now, the concept of the digital Indo-Pacific is linked to three factors, really. Uh, first, the region hosts the largest and most rapidly growing internet user bases in the world, accounting for a little over half of the world's internet users. Now, these users are primarily young and mobile. Over 90% access uh, the internet using their phones. So that really means uh, a target user base very much like yourselves and the audience here. And it's largely because of them that e-commerce and fintech services are booming across the region today. So this is a highly engaged and wired user base. And people in Thailand, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, and India spend the most time online on their phones in the world. All right, so that's something for all of us to be proud of. Um, second, the search for alternatives to the U.S.-India, I mean, sorry, the U.S.-China trade wars has prompted several countries in the Indo-Pacific to boost investments in domestic technology, capacity building, research and development, and skilling. So there is also a move within the region towards self-sufficiency, and we call it uh, Atma Nirbharata in some ways, right? Third, 
the upheavals, upheavals caused by the COVID pandemic have uh, driven home how essential and fragile global technology flows can be. For the better part of the last two years, governments, businesses, and individuals have had to rely on online means for continuity. And within the Indo-Pacific, this has led to a greater appreciation of the importance of digital goods and services, and also a greater scrutiny of the bottlenecks created by global supply chains. Now, given this broad context, clearly bilateral technology partnerships have a crucial role to play in building stronger digital ecosystems across the region. And several such partnerships exist across the Indo-Pacific, producing significant outcomes. And it goes without saying that we need more instances of tech cooperation of this kind. And India, you know, because of its status as a, as a, as a dealing, as a global digital powerhouse, is really quite central to some of these digital and tech partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. And I'd like to draw your attention to just a couple of the relatively more high-profile initiatives involving India. So we have the India-Japan Digital Partnership, for example, and its offshoots. And we also have the Australia-India Cyber and Critical Technology Partnership. Now, the India-Japan Partnership, as you may know, was signed in 2018 and has focused on developing the startup ecosystem in both countries, promoting electronic system design and manufacturing, tech R&D cooperation, and digital security-related co collaborations. Um, a couple of years ago, in early 2021, India and Japan, in fact, signed an MOU to strengthen cooperation in the field of ICTs and 5G standardization. So this relationship with Japan is one that is burgeoning. It continues to grow. And we really do have very close bilateral ties with uh, Japan as a result. Under the Australia-India Cyber and Critical Technology Partnership, on the other hand, organizations from both countries have been working together since 2020 to develop ethical standards around emerging tech such as AI, 5G, 6G, the Internet of Things, quantum computing, blockchain, and big data. So these are the two uh, relatively more talked of ones, but then we also have a thriving cyber cooperation relationship with Bangladesh, which took off uh, just a year ago, right? So uh, these, these, are, uh, these sorts of agreements are quite central to promoting cyber security in the region. Now, this focus on Japan, Australia, and India brings me to my final point, which is about the Quad and its implications for cyber cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Globally, the incidence of cybercrime and cyber attacks has uh, virtually exploded since 2020. And this is certainly true of the Quad in the Indo-Pacific too. Fortunately, cybersecurity cooperation has been a built-in feature of the Quad since its birth. At the very first Quad Leaders Summit in 2021, for instance, Heads of government, government agreed on the need for stronger tech and cyber cooperation. Several mechanisms have since been set up to translate these intentions into action. And a broad range of multi-stakeholder cyber projects are in operation today. All of these generally try to aim to improve the defense of nations' uh, critical infrastructure, fight ransomware, and importantly, strengthen law enforcement for, for tackling cybercrime. So as a next step, what is important is for the Quad to evolve cyber capacity building programs that can be opened up to other partner nations in the Indo-Pacific. And the Quad could also initiate similar cyber engagements with other regional forums, most notably the ASEAN, of course. So I'd just like to conclude by observing that uh, some of the digital opportunities and challenges in the Indo-Pacific and uh, opportunities for India, really, might best be addressed by a combination of increased bilateral tech cooperation deeper plurilateral and minilateral engagements, and capacity building efforts in third countries. So um, in the next couple of days, as you discuss these topics, I do hope you're able to touch upon some of these points uh, in the course of this conference. And uh, here's wishing you the very best for your deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. With this, we've come to the end of the inaugural session, and I now request Dr. Shreya Moitro, Assistant Professor, Department of International Relations, Radhapur University, to kindly come to the dais to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope all of you are uh, engaged with this session already and it has uh, hopefully been able to orient and initiate you to the basic thematic scope of the conference connecting the Indo-Pacific, exploring the opportunities for India. 
we are looking forward to some very exciting sessions. Uh, we break for tea now, and before I do that, I uh, I would uh, just take a minute to formally propose the vote of thanks for the inaugural session. We profusely thank the uh, higher administrative authorities of the university who could make time and join us. Our honourable Pro Vice Chancellor Professor Tianjin Khachaj. Our Dean, uh, Madam Shucharita Chattopadhyay, and of course, our very esteemed uh, delegates and dignitaries who have joined us from different parts of India. Uh, Ms. Pragya, uh, our uh, Maharaj uh, Shami Shupananandu, uh, and also the dignitaries who have joined us uh, from uh, Delhi. Uh, I profusely thank uh, uh, Ms. Ronipan and our beloved uh, Professor Pathya Bhutan Boshu for uh, helping us initiate the conference. Uh, with uh, hopefully a very academic and very poignant note. I thank the members of the audience for being patient with us. Uh, we will, I think, take a few minutes before we break for tea. And uh, I... Okay, okay. So uh, we have... We have no tea right now. So yeah, so bear with us for a few minutes. And I again hand over the dice to uh, Ms. Olokananda to come, uh, continue with the deliberations. Thank you, ma'am. I would invite the distinguished panelists today to deliver the keynote address for today's deliberation. Professor Chintamani Mahapatra, founder and honorable chairperson, Kalinga Institute of Indo Pacific Studies, and retired professor and former pro vice chancellor, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Professor Shibashish Chatterjee, Professor, Department of International Relations, Jagatpur University. And I request Professor R.K. Satpati, former director, ICSSR, NERC, to kindly take over as the chair for the session. I would request the students of Department of International Relations to kindly felicitate our panelists and the chair. Thank you. We can have a round of applause, please. I request Professor R.K. Satapati to kindly take over as the chair for the session. Morning to you all. I think uh, Prajna Grita, the first uh, formal session. And then you know that uh, each and every the Mirroring Conference to start with keynote speech. 
and we have there are two very prominent personalities and those are specialists in this area so they will be the keynote speakers and not only that if you think about this is a specific uh, region as such not that this region was not there before but this new coining of this star it has uh, added significance especially the study of specific there are a lot of subjectivity when uh, while discussing about uh, the specific region from the both um, diplomatic point of view from uh, economic point of view we conceptually are so these aspects we hope that uh, to uh, keynote speakers they will address to individuals so first of all the question is time i will request uh, professor shantanu mahapatra to speak about uh, this particular Good morning, Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Bhaneri, for giving me the opportunity to share a few thoughts. Thank you so much. Namaskar. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Lahiri, and the Department of Inter International Relations for holding such a wonderful uh, conference and giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts all of you on such an important uh, subject today in the mainstream IR discussion debate taking place around the world. And uh, because this is a pet topic of mine, I will request the chair to stop me whenever he wants. Even I'm I'm also dying to have tea, so I'll not talk too much. After all, this this is keynote. I'll just give some notes and some keys, and the rest of the session you just pick up and debate and discuss, and together all of us will be wiser by the end of this particular conference. I have no doubt of, about this in my mind. Now, Indo-Pacific. Uh, those uh, researchers who always believe in looking at the intellectual origin of Indo-Pacific, there are some people who say how it all began. It is more than a century old as a term. Century old. It was in 1920. There was a German scholar, and his name was Karl Hospo. I, I can't pronounce properly. Uh, Hospofe. Karl Hosope, who first time probably used the term Indo-Pacific in 1920. 20 years later, one Indian historian, Kalidas Nag, gave a reference to this particular work and the concept. And after that, decades and decades passed by, and nobody talked about Indo-Pacific. Some of the international organizations, particularly those who are dealing with fishing, uh, soon after World War II, they talked. Of, they used the term Indo-Pacific. It all took a big uh, natural disaster to start a process, which evolved into the Indo-Pacific, and that was in 2004 when we had the tsunami. Then the four navies, belonging to India, the U.S., Japan, Australia, came together in order to help the disaster-affected people. And from that experiment of these wonderful four countries, together trying to address the disaster, the idea came upon the Japanese Prime Minister Abe in 2007. Three years later, he comes to India, addresses the parliament, and then he talks about the confluence of two seas, 
That's why it talks about Indian Ocean and the Pacific can be one, it cannot be separated. Initially, some people were excited about it. And then India, which was already holding bilateral naval exercises with the United States, slowly, slowly expanded to include Japan at one time, even Australia. And the moment all these four navies began exercises, China woke up. What's happening? That was just a time. And now these four countries are doing exercises. Chinese government sent a demands to all the capitals, don't do it. And at that moment, the Americans were involved up to the neck in fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, difficult days, global war and terror. And then the whole idea of making it a quiet naval exercise just disappeared. And the Australians left, right? For roughly about 10 years, everyone, including the academics, slept. Did not think about indo pacific anymore. And when the global war on terror regime was almost coming to an end, people were getting saturated with and tired with and fatigued with warfare. And in the meantime, and the, when the Americans are getting killed in Afghanistan, the Chinese are making a lot of money in the international market. And the whole big talk about Chinese economy, China is now the number one exporter in the world, number one importer in the world, number one manufacturer of goods in the world, number one consumer of luxury goods in the world, number one banker to the United States of America, all of China, China, China. It was in that context you had, I'm using a strong word, don't quote me, a crazy man called Donald Trump came to power in the United States. And in 27, he rediscovered Indo-Pacific, not talking about the big concept of Indo-Pacific, but in Manila, in the Philippines, when there was a conference, all these four countries, the leaders of the four countries, they had the idea of forming what is today, everybody talks about the quack in the Indo-Pacific. Then of course, subsequently, year by year, let me give you one, one bullet, bullet point developments. It, it was in 2017, 10 years after that, it was revived, the 2004 uh, collaboration among four countries. And in 2018, 2018, the American National Security Strategy Report for the first time mentioned Indo-Pacific. And subsequently next year, the National Defense Strategy of the United States yet again talked about the Indo-Pacific. And in 2019, the United States government brought out clear a report on the Indo-Pacific. Before that would happen even in India, the government of India were delay dialing even, they were not sure. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh sometimes used the term Indo-Pacific, goes to Japan, talks about Asia-Pacific. ASEAN countries are not very comfortable so many ASEAN-centric multilateral uh, activities going on in this part of the world, EAS, ARF, a defense ministers meeting, and then all kinds of things happening. Why Indo-Pacific again? Very, very uncomfortable. They thought they will be you know, pushed into the margin. Nobody knew what exactly was the interest between the construct of the Indo-Pacific. Right? Even India was not very sure about it. But, 2017, as the Quad began to evolve, it was Narendra Modi who went to Sangrila, and there he outlined clearly an Indian perspective on the Indo-Pacific. When all these things were happening, even before the Ministry of External Affairs opened a new division called Indo-Pacific, I did my little innovation and opened the center. Kalinga Institute of Indo-Pacific Studies, registered in Odisha, I was in Delhi, remote control technology, and I was doing all kinds of activities. Now it has stayed on. In the meantime, even the United States, just issuing reports, they also changed the name of uh, the Asia-Pacific Command to the Indo-Pacific Command. So structural changes were taking place, and in that sense, Indo-Pacific that we are debating today is roughly about six years old, 2017 onwards. But it has evolved so fast that many countries who would otherwise ignore Indo-Pacific and the China, just like the oceanic foam, it will vanish. But now they say, my God, this is going to be an Asian NATO. What a big jump. The Russians were equally uncomfortable with the Indo-Pacific. 
all the Japanese, Indians, Australians, Americans talking about Indo-Pacific and quiet and all very Russia, nowhere to be seen. And China initially thought is nothing, now it's very concerned about it. This is how the concept evolved. Now, what is the significance of this concept? Why it happened the way it happened? Very shortly, briefly. One important reason, in, probably in the minds of strategic thinkers and the planners in India, in the US, in Japan, in Australia, in other countries, is everybody talks about is the rise of China. And just now I reclave the points how China became very important suddenly. But why indo -Pacific? It is, again, my interpretation, probably because the dynamic economic growth in China ultimately made China a net importer of energy resources from the Middle East. And of course, its appetite for raw materials and commodities led China to explore getting all kinds of raw materials from Africa, Latin America and all. So the Indian Ocean, which was really in the periphery of Chinese construction, suddenly became critical, crucial for China's economic growth and development. And when the big powers plan it out, and they always try to compete with each other, segment each other, deny to one of the benefits in case it's necessary, the Americans thought this Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia base is not enough. We cannot separate the two. This area is very, very important. In case in the future there is a need to compete with China or to contain China, or to constrain China, then let us evolve a new kind of strategy and put together Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. That served India's purpose very well. As China was becoming big news everywhere in every capital, every newspaper, every television debate on practically every issue. India's growth story was also similarly becoming prominent in world. Within India, many Indians would keep on crying, no, 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 a lot of poverty, a lot of politicking, uh, you know, all kinds of Indian, Indian problem all of us know very well. But the world was looking at not this detailed, chaotic Indian system, but how India in the meantime emerged as a prominent player in international affairs. How India's GDP growth took place, India began to play more and more important role in all kinds of discourses, narratives, in international relations. That caught the attention. The Americans thought the Chinese would not like India. So why not make it Indo-Pacific? The Chinese actually don't like this because India is there. I remember a seminar of this kind in Uttarakhand a few years ago. <laughs> I'm telling this because it has again happened. Uh, in that seminar, one Chinese guy, with was seven, eight Chinese, one guy said, Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. I said, is South China Sea China Sea? That guy was smart. No, no, no. That is a sea, it is ocean. I said, suppose we change the name of the Chinese, keep on changing names, right? we change the name of Arabian Sea to Gujarat Sea, will you say this is India's? No, 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 no. Again, very recently, last week, there was a statement, not from an academic like us, but from the spokesperson of the foreign ministry saying, Indian Ocean is not India. Right? So when the Chinese would not like something, the Americans would definitely push it. So make it indo -Pacific. In the meantime, India's interest also points it. Active policy. You know, for a long time, India was sunk into South Asia jacket. It served the Chinese and the American interest. But the after the end of the Cold War, when we tried to look beyond South Asia, talked about look east, then act east, then act super fast east under Narendra Modi. It served our purpose. If China can open a Gaza port here. Uh, can't we send a few vessels to South China Sea? For a long time before this, this thing happened, India was tight-lipped about what the Chinese would do, whether denying visa to somebody traveling from Kashmir or creating some naughty things along the border. We're tight-lipped about it. But the first time when the 
Prime Minister goes to the United States and issues a joint statement and openly says, we are concerned about development in South China Sea. That was one of the reflections of India becoming assertive, more open, rather than maintaining studied silence. So we thought that even our interest in bettering our ties with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, even South Pacific, which no Indian PM ever went, we were having a South Pacific Island you know, connection. So it served India's purpose and the American purpose. But Chinese were still off. Russians don't like it. Europeans didn't think about it. But, but today, there is an European strategy in Indo-Pacific, German strategy in Indo-Pacific, French strategy in Indo-Pacific, Australian one, Japanese one, Indian one. All of them, they think that this is a new construct. In terms of economic activities, of course, very dynamic. Look at what's happening in the Atlantic. The European Union, one of the best examples of regional integration is facing a lot of problems, right? After the Brexit, then the Eurozone crisis, and then the pandemic. So Indo-Pacific is actually the bright spot for making the global economy dynamic. You read the World Bank report, read the IMF report, everyone talks about the importance of the Indo-Pacific. So this is a significant topic that we are going to spend the whole day in this. A few minutes more. What are the challenges? Every challenge, every word I'll say, <laughs> we can have a seminar. So I'll not talk too much about it. One dominant challenge to the peace, stability, growth, development in Indo-Pacific is the nature of the relationship evolving between China and the United States of America. A game of chicken going on periodically in the South, uh, South China Sea. This side, an American ship is coming. This is Chinese ship is coming very close. If they move further, that could be not accident, but that could be confrontation. Right. Now, it's a game of chicken. Who is going to move first? Sometimes Chinese, sometimes Americans. China will go reclaim island, make military facilities. One American Air Force Navy, uh, Navy Air Force plane will come and hover around. Chinese will say, hey, move. This is Chinese space. The American will say, sorry, this is international space. But how much time will go over? They will go, go back. But this kind of tension that we are seeing now over human rights violation issues in Xinjiang, death of democracy in Hong Kong, then you have the tariff war, which led to an economic cold war between the two. Then Taiwan is a very hot potato. Anytime it, it can be a flashpoint. So this China-USA relationship is creating a lot of problems for many countries in this part of the world. China has become number one trade partner of all the American allies and partners like India at, at some point of time, including the Japanese and Australians. Now. So now the big problem is if the Chinese and the Americans, they keep on quarreling, how to take sides? China, a great economic partner, America subsidizes and protects their security. Choice is very difficult. So this is a major challenge. And how countries are going to navigate, you can debate during the whole day. And then, of course, second important thing is concerning even to India very deeply. For quite a few years, all of us heard a very nice theory. Peaceful rise of China. We want to earn money. We are very good guys. We don't believe in war, violence, and all that. And people bought that idea. And then the entire world literally went and did shopping in, the, in China, investment, trade, and made money, including Latin Americans, Africans, uh, Europeans, Indians, everyone. That peaceful rise of China has come to a full stop. We see what's happening in South China Sea. We see what's happening in East China Sea, Singapore Island, Diao Island conflict. And of course, we know better what this did to us in along the LAC. You know. So this Chinese assertiveness is a major challenge. It has been 
it is and is going to be in the near future and in the process the water is getting so muddy that the experimentation about having a tpp trans pacific partnership and then a parallel rcep you know two steps forward one step backward again three steps forward two and a half steps backward this way these things have evolved but it is yet to take up the ground because the americans are not in indians are also not in chinese are in both and the american allies are some now yes now then not no yes no confused completely and how to really create a situation and ambiance where some kind of trade investment relationship becomes normal is a major challenge in this part of the world and then it's a very big issue right now the nuclear issues are back on the table for quite some time after the end of the cold war people thought nuclear bomb is only a show piece keep it somewhere the war is not going to fought using nuclear weapons is a no no you cannot use it it is a political weapon a debate was there but now particularly since the ukraine war and the sever rattling by putin for potential use of nuclear weapons and literally deploying weapons in belarus it has woken up many people particularly in the indo pacific free principally japan south korea australia they began they have begun to debate on having a weapon in all these three countries i have written extensively on all these three countries right now the korean president is uh, on a six day trip to washington dc and why was it important it is more, more than symbolic uh, president yoon yoon made a statement if the north koreans push us too much we may have to have our own nuclear weapons that created a lot of problem in the you know all those countries which are champions of non proliferation and south korea can go nuclear in a very short time so are the japanese australians will take a much longer time now this nuclear issues particularly north korean nuclear test missile test repeatedly sever rattling hum dekh lenge mera kya hoga a kaliat kind of statement americans we have icbm we can hit any part of the united states of america now they experimenting with under, underwater drones so now this nuclear proliferation issue how it is going to go we don't know we cannot ignore this at all and if another round of proliferation activities take place what will happen to peace stability in this part of the world is a big question mark and then of course the the last but not the least there so many other i'm just making a few points taiwan has become a major issue now between us and china that can be a flash point that can be a flash point whether it is going to lead to a complete total war between us and china unlikely unless they are mad but if this particular issue is a hot potato remains so then the undercurrent of instability mistrust doubt Uh, will remain and that will spoil the show for making indo pacific a vibrant area of economic growth uh, in the future finally finally little bit about india why should we bother about indo pacific indian ocean was okay for us we are not like china china's economy is too big china is militarily more powerful china is a member of un security council we have been trying crying horse hame bhi banao member make us a member why should you bother about indo pacific is a question some indians ask in response i would say it is important for a variety of reasons because it is going to serve india's interest i have already hinted one or two points for example it will enhance the diplomacy domain of india to a much larger region then keep keep talking about uh, india pakistan kashmir uh, sri lanka we have to think big it was during world war 2 when the bombs were exploding and the rockets were flying and the war was ravaging all that pandit nehru who finally became india's pm he was in jail 
in jail when he wrote his prison diary, it was in 1940s, 43. Indian leaders always think, as I said yesterday, they have post-dated image of epic power. He thought, after the war is over, India would be an important play in, he used the term, Asia-Pacific. We tried our best. We played a role also. Asian Relations Conference took place a few months before India became independent. Then, of course, another one for Indonesian, addressing the Indonesian question. Then we thought very big, and then we went to Bandung. Then, of course, we thought much bigger and talked to normal and movement. We always want to play a role, right? The time has come where India can play not a role only in name and discourse and articulation, but in reality. If we expand our vision and our activities at least to Indo-Pacific, later it can expand to the world if we can move in that particular direction. And then, both for our economic expansion, active policy, and for military expansion. This has become important, and we are already playing an important role. Selling of some missiles to the Philippines, the Vietnamese initially said yes, and said no, now again negotiating. Indonesians are also negotiating to buy Brahmos missile. We are mili giving military training to many people from Southeast Asia. So, ASEAN countries which ignored India for a long time saying India can't be of any help. So long as China is, what can India do? We are scared of China. We cannot say so, but can you help? Now, that total rejection of India has now gained. In a piecemeal way, in a small step, India is beginning to play a role that it would like to play a role of that kind. Because in every instance, China would try to push India out of any mechanism. There are evidences, but now that cannot happen anymore. In East Asia Summit, India was a member. ASEAN Regional Forum, now India is a member. It became a full dialogue partner of ASEAN much later. But the Chinese are trying to push India out. Now, they cannot. So it is important for us to look beyond that. And then, of course, remember, when Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC Forum was set up, of course, the Australians did a smart move. They proposed APEC and kept the Americans out. Right? This is after the end of the Cold War. Americans were furious, angry. Then, of course, they pressurized them, bulldozed them, and then got in from the backside. When India applied for a membership, India is not a Pacific power, Pacific country. In 1954, when Southeast Asia Treaty Organization was signed, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, Pakistan, which is left of India, west of India, was part of CETO. So, in their regional calculation, Pakistan could be part of CETO, but India can't be part of ASEAN. Right? But that was the argument. But now, those things are not going to be possible anymore. And of course, vision that India had, too much of obsession, no good about Pakistan. What is Pakistan doing? If the Pakistani leader, leader comes to India, oh, how do dress? Hai? His button is open or closed. You know, Musa Rapta, you remember? Total obsession. One of the ways to lessen the obsession and focus on the larger goal is for India to think a little bigger than what we have done in the recent past. And now we are doing better. And that is indo -Pacific. So I think at the moment, the way things are happening, we are on the right track. The issues are many, very complex, but I'm sure during the whole day, all of you are going to throw more light. I gave you uh, the note, you provide me the keys later. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to have a lot of view about uh, the issue, outstanding uh, uh, issues like uh, why it is politically significant, militarily important, and at the same time, so why economically also it is crucial, not only for India, but even for the countries in the region. And how generally? Um, this uh, term in the Pacific is how he has given a resolution of term 
and you will obviously draw it from its own oriented stroke being a term of but then I decided that to keep my book carrying forward, then you need a lot of archiving and a lot of documentation possible. It's very, very good. And it's a very exciting text, okay? And then sometimes texts are misread for the time. Osopher, in fact, gets completely attributed by the Nazi and sort of gets represented at the time with a non geopolitical, you know, what is it called? Theory, and sort of theory. Now, the book, let me sort of you know, share this with you. The book, in fact, is not for diplomatic practice. The book, in fact, is a political theory. Essentially, a political theory of what modern effect is. And let me share this with you. So, why is this in fact new? There is no history of our inheritance law in history of the universe. The word C, in fact, is old. The word nation, in fact, is new. So, therefore, one would say, so many subtitles, you know, as you call Cognitive medicine and sometimes cognitive ideas in order to determine what the reality is going to be. So the first uh, register, therefore, is that the LAA is in the TV And the time in the first register, in fact, the time in the first moment, the first state, in fact, is not. And then you come at your own, you know, all those kind of things, and say, many, many decades later, in our time, in contemporary time, My contemporary can't be your contemporary. And he would say, I mean, you know, you are 20 years old, comparatively, I mean, you know, I am 54 years old. So, how is it that our contemporary is So, even when one is sort of talking about contemporary, one would also have to sort of understand this idea of the contemporary is that it's not something which is due to ideation and imagination. It can be designed for something which is so humanity. Any exciting register in which you read the concept of equation, you read them. All these are geographical registers, which means it's a kind of an application concept. One is that it's in fact a talking for power, the talking for power is that in a sense trying to make something which is a bit natural geography. You know, how do the bounded entities make sort of, you know, relate to something which is not So that's the first thing. The first meaning of it is. Second is that the Indo Pacific is not only about conversations of national environment, but it is also conversation about shared maritime region. So we don't really have one kind of a shared maritime region at all. It's a very different kind of shared maritime region. The third is that is that if you think of today, also we talk of global capital. Think of, think of it if you go to global capital, it in fact become a non space of capital. The global capital, in fact, doesn't really have to mention it, it becomes a non space of capital. And finally, all spaces are ideation. So, you also have to be a thing that you can talk So, this is one part of what I want to share with you. The other part of what I want to share with you, in fact, is that the conventional IR theory, all of the conventional IR theories, in fact, make some sense of the concept. You can read with them. So, Professor Mahapatra did you know, make my task easier. This is what Professor Mahapatra has largely said. In fact, it's not really supposed to do a conventional realist understanding of the state of what Indo Pacific is about. So, you ask the realist what is the Indo Pacific, the answer is that you read and read the book that was produced in one. How and why does it come up then? It comes up because of two essentially main things. The first one is that the arrival. As India arises, obviously we can't really be happy with the ocean in which we are engaged. This is our ocean, this is the Indian ocean. And the play of the word India's ocean, India's ocean, the fact of the matter is that India's geopolitical ambitions and care. Obviously, as we grow, they cannot be really just pocket the water, you know, in which we find ourselves. But automatically, India moves to the sea. And as we move into the Pacific, there is a need to counter this. Because the Chinese, in fact, are already in And the Chinese rise, in fact, in China. And the other thing that is that it's also built on the notion of the reverse. And the idea of the rebalance is, in fact, the But what we have to understand is that the essentially idea of the 
you know, uh, sticks and uh, you know who kind of uh, on point in that sense. Let me talk about the idea that they're not being kind of treated in shape like that. So the American understanding, in fact, of the meaning is why it is. It is in the division that we read the limitations of the Greek word to be called. Let me share three things. The first of it is India's education. India obviously wants a space for itself and it is aspiration for honor for God. It's automatically in fact come as a group, but India doesn't want to call China. So it doesn't really want to mention China, it doesn't want to then get into a kind of a classic of Typically, if you look at the American, they have divided. They divided the states first, they divided by virtue of the fact that they are all different states that are very much still sort of uh, dedicated in their practice of Asia. And as the theater goes, the second problem comes up. Because in a large theater, can you really be able to protect your speech? So it's easy to be smaller. As the theater goes, leadership obviously. And the point is that the presentation of Rossi, you can see that there is no consensus on the severity of the Chinese threat. What kind of a threat is that actually? It can partly you know, separate the threats of geoeconomic and geopolitics any longer. For them, it is not necessarily easier. But we find that it is not very, very difficult to do away with Chinese threat. So they are forced to the limitations in place to be integrated in that region. But realism, in fact, can make a lot of these kinds of things, let's say, of the United concepts. But typically, it is made to all dimensions, a very different, let's say, between the work of companies that they can, on the one hand, in fact, a very broad representation of the argument, and again, through the market, in fact, interesting that the best possible option for the Asian state now is to be an accommodative option. To all of us together, again, we envision where we can all sort of rise together. And to contrast this with the conventional idea of the United States, where the idea in fact is that something is not necessarily that it is invariably that. And if the Chinese trade grows, then obviously they could be back, would be far more clear for them. Does liberalism in fact that anything is possible? The understanding of the international status in two ways. Liberals, in fact, in the sense that they are either operating in the sense or they move to official institutions. So, in fact, they come, you know, I would say, in the way. Complex interdependence obviously becomes critical and taken again by virtue of the fact that Asia, in fact, is so very significant in terms of trade and in terms of trade. In fact, it's the longer period of trade. Okay, I mean, you know, that's <laughs> in fact, it's amazing. Institutions also, particularly in Asia, are making the fact that they have to have a model. A lot of particularly Chinese, you know, particularly in the international issues, for instance, have been brought into the same adaptation to the same framework, which in fact can give them the model. There are problems, however. And let's say there are two very big reasons for this. One is that we, there is a kind of an independent structure. So if you look at the Indo Pacific, you have to be a lot of but if you look at the Indian part of the world, and you ask Western economic they are so Institutions, again, if there is it is really possible to scale up institutions at all. Some institutions function very well in small scale. The moment you scale up, there will typically be challenges and difficulties. But this is not quite clear. That whether in a kind of an institution like the Asian company can really be strong. So institutions as a group that very base. And actually by finally, what about contractivism? Okay, contractivism is very broadly saying that Indian culture makes sense in terms of ideas, all regions are ideational concepts, can be regional, shared, these kinds. But there, the party is in fact to bind together states to that party in some sense. So they're not merely coming together for a city, but they're also coming together to share. 
My point is this, that we look at this very good. Three things. First is, if you think democracy, what about the democratic system? Virtually every state in the region, in fact, had other borders. Second is shared norms and shared values. Australia wants to be a norm entrepreneur in the region. So a lot of industry wants to create norms that would be too easy to settlement of these people. So you can't build castles on the sand. And when the sand is there are no shared norms in the region. And I think you create shared norms in this way in which you need to build the world. And finally, is there Nationally binding. Are our expectations the same in the region? What the Americans expect in the Indo Pacific, the Indians do not expect in Asia. What the Australians want in Asia is not the security diamond that is happening in the So, therefore, there are these kinds of problems. In fact, they are not very easy to execute for in terms of an isolation of the problem. So, I end my project by saying. That we should not blindly take care of the same problem. We often, in fact, have no option but to care about it. But it's always better to come the other way around. This is like the empirical, the highly accurate situation, rather than doing the opposite, which is to start with a predisposed kind of an additional concept and then push everything, all the empirical material that we have in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We are now supported by the spiritual travel and the issue of the music. We have also discussed about the spiritual transfer of the target of the motive behind it. And at the same time, the contest of the region contest and competition of the region. Uh, and whether they can be put into any case without time work or not. So, realism, uh, and again, uh, uh, I did not construct all these things we have discussed, accommodating approach and stuff, balancing approach, and at the same time. So, whether independence or independence as such is possible, we are in. Uh, Indian Open Seas. So those things we have put some questions and uh, also some um, uh, controversies relating to this concept. And finally, we believe that for the sake of changing and your concept, the most recent problems that has been captured. Thank you. So now, uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, two questions to them. Uh, I advise. Uh, I think that uh, we are running behind. Uh, there is no question that was just another question. <laughs> yeah. So why the asking for this stage to whom you are asking question and be specific about your question.
Any other?
With this, we come to the end of the keynote session, and I now request Srimati Urbi Das, Assistant Professor, Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University, to deliver the vote of thanks for the session. Thank you. I, uh, on behalf of the Department of International Relations, my conveners and team Jadavpur Association of International Relations, profusely thank Professor Chintamani Mahapatra and Professor Chatterjee. Sir, we are really grateful and lucky to have two eminent experts talking on the same platform, deliberating on such an important topic. And I also thank Professor Satapati for sharing the session. And finally, I thank the beautiful audience for keeping in time and also being patient and you know enlightening us with your beautiful questions. We also have a, a small arrangement for tea and some snacks. So I would like to invite you all for tea. And we break for this session and we hope to join back in 15 minutes for another very interesting deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. 